everybody for attending today. We have with us Dr. Corey Evans, who is an assistant professor at Rice University. Uh, Dr. Evans and I went to grad school together, so we've known each other for quite some time now. Um, so we do very different um, ends of the spectrum in science, but uh, Dr. Evans uses bony fishes to study the ecology and evolution of phenotypic diversity. And I'll let him tell you more about that because that's about the extent of what I know about that. But um, Dr. Evans was a rock star grad student and then went on to do a couple of postdocs and recently started his position at Rice. And so he is just getting bigger and better and brighter um, by the moment. And so I will turn it over to you, Dr. Evans. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Menard. Uh, let me share my screen here. And all right, we should be ready. All right. So hello everybody, my name is Corey Evans, uh, and today I will be talking about evolutionary mosaics, the interplay between innovation and integration. And I'll really be talking about uh, how integration and modularity kind of influence evolutionary innovation across some uh, groups of fishes. So uh, whenever I start my talks, I like to actually start with a thought exercise to kind of orient the audience uh, towards the kinds of questions that I typically uh, ask and how I ask questions uh, whenever I approach a new system. Uh, I move around in systems a lot, so it helps uh, to kind of have this uh, consistent line of questioning. So uh, let's have, so I like to have everybody in their seats, in their, uh, you know, living rooms or sofas or offices, uh, picture an image and start asking some questions. So uh, I have on our, I have on my screen today, a African male lion uh, hanging out in this event. So I want you to look at this lion and I want you to kind of get an image of this lion in its natural habitat in your mind, right? So while you're thinking about this lion, let's start asking some questions. First question, what is the typical life of this male lion like? So uh, what are the comings and goings? How is this lion spending its time? Is this lion Netflix and chilling? Uh, you know, how, how is this lion moving throughout its environment? How is it sensing and understanding its environment? Next, we're gonna pretend to be comparative anatomist here. Uh, so the next question that we're gonna ask is very specific. Uh, what is this lion using its skull for? As comparative anatomist, anatomist, the next thing that we are going to do is catch this lion and yank the skull out of its head and start asking the hard questions, right? So the first and primary function of the skull for all vertebrates in general is to house what we call the sensory capsules. So this, these are your eyes, your ears, and your nose. Um, and the lion is no different. Uh, male lions in particular spend a lot of their time uh, actually patrolling their habitat uh, looking for potential rivals uh, and looking for potential mates. So that lion is going to be sniffing the grass, sniffing the air and listening for other rival male lions. And they'll be sensing with the Jacobson's organ in their mouth, uh, potential uh, females who might be in heat. So uh, sensory biology is obviously a very important aspect of this lion's life. Next, uh, this photo is always difficult to find uh, because we know that male lions don't do really the brunt of the hunting and the pride, but uh, they do get brought in occasionally to bring down large game. So as you can see, this lion is clearly using its skull to hang on for dear life uh, to this Cape buffalo. And if this lion and the pride are successful, uh, they will tip this buffalo over and uh, they will put the clamps on either its uh, mouth or its throat to try to choke it out. Uh, so you can imagine that if you were to find a Cape buffalo and you were to bite onto its back, uh, that Cape buffalo will be running and you will lose all the teeth in your mouth. Uh, but this doesn't happen to the lion uh, because the lion's skull is fortified to withstand those forces. So now we have two functions, sensory biology and prey capture and processing. Lastly, and the reason why I pick male lions is because they have, the, they have this interesting aspect of their natural history where they engage in intraspecific uh, aggressive interactions with other male lions. Uh, so as you can see, we have two, uh, two male lions engaged in a fisticuffs here. And if you were to take, if you were to take a shot to the face by one of these lions, you would be in really bad shape. Uh, however, these lions uh, hit each other in the face all the time with uh, seemingly minimal damage. And the reason for this is because the lion skull, the male lion skull in particular, is robust and fortified to absorb blows to the face like this. So uh, you can take and you can kind of imagine the skull and you can imagine all of its individual functions. 
as separate vectors of selection that are exerting pressure across the skull. As you can see, some of these arrows are actually uh, opposing each other, and that's because there are oftentimes trade-offs uh, that are uh, trade-offs that these animals have to navigate uh, when they're adapting their morphologies. I've included a fourth arrow here, which is phylogeny, which is really the history of how the skull has responded to these selective pressures in the past and a roadmap for how it might respond in the future. Pretty cool. So uh, this, uh, <laughs> this thought exercise is really easy because we know a lot about lions, right? We know that when they're young, they hang out in the jungle with their potential prey items, and then they grow up to be Beyonce or Donald Glover, um, you know, Seth Rogen, sometimes, you know, he ties himself into the loop there. And in other cases, uh, the lions leave Africa altogether. They go to Juilliard, they learn how to dance, and they hang out with Chris Rock. Um, however, we happen to know a lot less about other vertebrate groups. And we'll be talking about those groups in, in a second. So the focus of my new lab and uh, my lab these days is really the uh, evolution of innovation. We're really kind of, uh, we're really focused on how innovations occur and what are some of the uh, environmental and developmental factors that influence the evolution of innovation. So what exactly is an evolutionary innovation in the first place? A evolutionary innovation is a novel trait or function that results in the colonization of a novel region of trait space uh, that allows an organism to exploit a novel ecological resource. So what exactly does that mean? Uh, an evolutionary innovation basically is a new trait that allows an animal to do or allows an organism to do something that it was not able to do before. So flight is typically considered to be an evolutionary innovation because once an animal gains the ability to fly, they gain access to airspace. We've seen, we've seen this happen with birds where they evolve from terrestrial dinosaurs to become these things that squawk at us outside of our garbage cans and dive bomb us on the beach when we're eating our french fries. Uh, the same could be said for tube snouted uh, vertebrates as well. Basically, they've evolved these really long faces so that they can stick their faces literally in places that they could not reach before. So these are just some examples of evolutionary innovation. I was not the first person to obviously be interested in evolutionary innovation. This, uh, this particular line of inquiry has been fairly popular for over a century. And much of the focus uh, for the evolution of innovation has been on some of the, what we call extrinsic or environmental drivers. So how does the environment stimulate evolutionary innovation? Uh, how does ecological opportunity promote evolutionary innovation, et cetera, et cetera. And there's generally been less of a focus on some of the intrinsic drivers or organismal properties that might facilitate the evolution of innovation. However, over the past 10 years, uh, we've actually learned quite a bit about how about some of the uh, organism or intrinsic or developmental properties that can uh, influence patterns of trait diversification and patterns of uh, evolutionary innovation. Primarily, the uh, the properties that we'll be talking about today or the processes that we'll be talking about today are differences in developmental uh, trait covariation, typically due to pleiotropy or, in some cases, functional coupling. So uh, I'll be basically describing two very important cases of trait covariation uh, generally, and then I'll explain their, their macroevolutionary consequences. So first, let's talk about integration. So integration occurs where there's a high degree of covariation or crosstalk between traits, such that if one trait changes, the other trait changes as well. Or uh, more specifically, if a mutation occurs over here in trait one, you expect it to be reflected over here in trait two, typically due to something that's called pleiotropy, which is uh, a shared underlying genetic signaling network. Uh, so basically, as one trait changes, the other one changes as well. The second case is called modularity. So modularity, at first glance, uh, might look like the opposite of integration. However, I would argue that it's actually a special case of integration um, where individual traits are integrated amongst themselves. So if a musician occurs over here in trait one, we expect it to be fairly evenly distributed uh, within a single trait. However, and, and you expect to see the same thing in trait two. However, the difference occurs between traits here. So uh, if, a, if a mutation occurs over here in trait one, you don't necessarily expect to see it reflected in trait two, uh, because there is uh, very little to, there's little to no crosstalk going on between going on between traits, and this is the difference uh, between integration and modularity. Now, at macroevolutionary timescales, integration and modularity can have some very interesting consequences. So, uh, for the case of integration, we typically thought that integration can constrain rates of morphological evolution due to something called conditioning on trait on other traits. So basically, as networks become more and more integrated and encompass more and more and more traits and they grow larger, it becomes more challenging to find individual mutations 
that, are, uh, that can be beneficial across all these traits. And this creates something called evolutionary inertia. Uh, I liken this to the Erica Badu bag lady scenario, where this woman is trying to catch the bus and she has too many bags, too much luggage, and she's too slow, so she can't catch the bus. So in order to, so in order to speed up, she has to let go of some of her bags. Uh, this, is a, this is a great, I guess, a description of evolutionary inertia. However, uh, evolutionary integration is actually not all that bad. Uh, so here we have a zebra, which is a quadruped. Uh, zebras walk on all four limbs. And if you're a quadruped and you're walking on all four limbs, you really need all of your limbs to be fairly equal in length. Uh, and integration studies have shown that the quadruped limbs are actually highly integrated in their legs. The last thing you want if you're trying to run as a zebra is one leg this short, one leg this long, another that's a samurai sword, and the last one that's a rocket ship, because you might look really, really cool, but you probably won't get very far. Uh, so integration actually can be very valuable in functional systems. In the case of modularity, modularity gets a ton of attention uh, because of some of its uh, downstream macroevolutionary uh, properties. So uh, at macroevolutionary timescales, the, in the uh, independence of some of these traits or the semi-autonomy of these traits allows them to actually uh, respond independently to different selective stimuli. So now uh, when a trait is under selection it does, or a mutation occurs, uh, it doesn't, the mutation doesn't have to be beneficial ac across many, many traits. Maybe it only has to be beneficial for one trait. Uh, and this allows, uh, this is thought to facilitate functional specialization and functional diversification uh, because it's just easier to change things when they're not all linked together. So in the case of uh, quadruped, or sorry, in the case of bipedal mammals, here we have a Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant was a bipedal mammal. He did all his walking on his hind limbs and freed up his forelimbs to do cool things like dunk basketballs and shoot threes in Paul Pierce's face. Uh, and studies have shown that, again, there's actually a decrease in integration between the hind limbs and the forelimbs of bipedal animals. Um, so this, this was thought to be an example of how evolution of modularity might facilitate uh, functional specialization. So as you might have guessed, I think all of our examples so far have either come from birds or mammals or, or other tetrapod groups, and this is not uh, by accident. A lot of what we know about integration modularity really come from uh, tetrapod systems, um, and this is because they're larger, we know more about them, uh, <laughs> sometimes they look more like us, or they're more uh, readily accessible in museum collections. However, if you want to know the true vertebrate story, if you want to know uh, what the what the evolution of the skull was, uh, what the evolutionary history of the skull, for example, was, you really need to be looking at this group called teleos fishes. So fishes in general, uh, most fishes are teleos fishes, and fishes in general comprise over half of all vertebrate diversity. So if you're trying to understand the story of vertebrates and you're not studying fishes, you're actually missing the majority of the story, which is kind of wild. Um, and you see this all the time. So fishes are fairly understudied in a lot of ways. Um, oftentimes, because they're a little harder, they're a little, uh, they're less, they're less well understood, and they're oftentimes harder to get to. However, uh, the fish skull in our in our case is a very important aspect of evolutionary biology, biology that we need to understand. So fishes also don't just have vertebrates beat in the numbers game, right? There's not just a lot of fishes. Fishes are doing things with their morphology that are like mind blowing compared to other vertebrate groups. So here we have a largemouth bass suction feeding. So here this bass is pursuing a prey atom that's off screen. And look at how many bones move when this bass opens its mouth, right? If you sit in your chair and you open your jaw, <laughs> you can count how many bones move and the answer is one. However, uh, for this bass or for most teleos fishes, their skulls are highly kinetic and really, really dynamic. And this is why uh, it's really I think it's really important that we start focusing some of our attention on the evolution of teleos skulls. So the teleos group that we'll be talking about today are the wrasses uh, from the family Labor Day. They are a very charismatic marine, uh, mostly marine fish group. Uh, there are about 600 species and they're uh, just really gorgeous. They're distributed across tropical reefs and even some higher latitudes. Uh, they're the second largest family of marine fishes and they're fairly well understood from a ecological uh, perspective in terms of diet and habitat. So they're a really exciting kind of dynamic clade to study. Another reason why wrasses are so exciting is because they're literally packed full of evolutionary innovations. Uh, one of their more popular innovations is this thing called pharyngeal nathi, which is basically which basically explains 
uh, the second set of jaws that rats have evolved in their throat, kind of like alien style. So they have the oral jaws and they have the second set of jaws in their throat, and they've evolved this to allow them to crush hard prey like clams and snail shells and things like that. Uh, and these, uh, these jaws have uh, basically morphologically diversified in and of themselves and have uh, taken on a wide array of different functions and things like that. And we'll get to that in a second. The next, th another thing that rats have done that's really cool is this thing that I call hypersection feeding. So here we have a sling jaw wrasse, and this fish has the ability to extend its jaw uh, more than one third of its total body length to catch evasive prey. So this is the equivalent of you walking into your kitchen and seeing like a hot Cheeto laying on the counter on the far side of the room and you just launching your face at it and bringing it back to you without leaving the doorway. Pretty dramatic. So I, I just use the sling jaw wrasse as an example to show you how fishes are doing things that <laughs> other vertebrates can even dream of with their skulls. So it's, it's pretty dynamic and it's pretty impressive. So out of all these different uh, RAS innovations that I've showed you, I would actually argue that probably the most impressive thing that RASs have done with their, with their body morphology might actually be the evolution of the beak in parrotfishes. Uh, so, lots of, so lots of different vertebrate groups have evolved beaks. We know birds have evolved beaks and triceratops have evolved, have evolved beaks. But I would argue today that uh, no one has done beaks quite like parrotfishes have done beaks. So let's talk about this parrotfish beak for a second. Uh, so the parrotfish beak is, uh, has a very unique structure. It's actually composed of several small teeth that are slabbed together in this, uh, in this very aesthetically pleasing uh, structure. And each one of these teeth is actually composed of one of the strongest biological materials on the planet. It's pretty crazy. So a single parrotfish tooth is, as, is about as strong as a shark tooth, stronger than piranha teeth, definitely stronger than human teeth, uh, and uh, even stronger than gar armor. Uh, so these parrotfish teeth are very, very strong and they're very durable. And you might be asking, why on earth does a parrotfish need teeth that are this strong? And the answer, I would argue, could actually be found in their diet. So here we have a midnight parrotfish that's swimming around, and hopefully on camera, he will bite into this rock face. Come on. There we go. Right. So uh, this is uh, a, so this is basically an excavating parrotfish, and they spend all day basically from sunup to sundown grazing on hard corals. Uh, so basically, coral coral skeletons are basically rock, and if you're going to evolve to eat rock all day long, you need a very very hard and durable uh, structure to be able to do that, and that is uh, what parrotfishes have done with their beak. So uh, so it might be pretty clear that if you're going to eat rocks. Maybe you need something that's strong enough to break rocks off and break them into smaller pieces. However, if I were to go outside and eat a rock, I might be able to get the rock in my mouth. I might even be able to swallow the rock. However, you could imagine that uh, this would create other problems downstream, if you will. Uh, <laughs> however, parrotfishes have also solved this problem. So remember I told you that wrasses actually have a second set of jaws in the throat. Well, parrotfishes have uh, subsequently modified this second set of jaws in the throat into a mill. Uh, so these animals will ingest these hard pieces of coral, and they'll grind them up in their throat in, uh, into this really fine powder, and then they'll excrete that, that uh, fine white sand all over the reef uh, again. And, par and parafishes do this all day long. As you can imagine, coral is not a very nutritious diet, so they have to eat a lot of it. Um, so you're probably asking, uh, why did Corey WebEx into this seminar just to show us photos of fishes pooping on people? And... I would argue that parafish poop is like no other poop that we've ever experienced uh, <laughs> as, a, as a radiation, right? So uh, parafish poop, you might have even recognized it uh, when you saw that, white, that fine white sand. Turns out that this poop actually uh, forms a lot of our major tropical coastlines. Uh, so especially in uh, tropical islands like Hawaii and the Maldives, a lot of those white sand beaches are, also, are actually mostly parafish poop, which is pretty exciting. Um, and if you're, if you're thinking, well, wait, how much poop can a parrotfish produce, you know, in its lifetime? Well, a single parrotfish in one year can produce 450 kilograms of poop, right, or sand. And parrotfishes have been around for like 30 million years. That's a lot of parrotfishes. That's a lot of sand. Uh, so, that's how we've, so that's how we've gotten a lot of these really gorgeous tropical coastlines. So one of the reasons why I think that the parrotfish innovation is so exciting is because basically one weird group of wrasses decided to change, change their face radically. And the next thing you know, we get white sand beaches, we get Instagram, we have tropical coastlines and wish you were there cards. And it's all because one lineage of fishes got kind of odd.
uh, you know, and call me when a bird does that. So as I've hinted at, uh, parafishes uh, evolved from this group of wrasses, the, the family Labor Day, which means that the parafish beak evolved from a wrasse, a, a generalized wrasse jaw. So how, so how and where did this beak come from? So here I have the lower jaw of a wrasse uh, where the dentary is highlighted in purple and the uh, angular bone is in green. And this will kind of be the uh, framework and the icons that we'll be looking at for the rest of the talk. So basically, uh, I said parafishes evolved from a generalized RAS. This is kind of a generalized RAS lower jaw system, right? You can see basic fish teeth and a basic fish angular bone. However, uh, one of the cool things about parafishes is, is that not all parafishes have beaks. Indeed, we actually have some uh, kind of earlier branching parafishes that have not yet evolved beaks and they represent kind of the ancestral state for the lower jaw and for the uh, pre-beaked morphology of parafishes, if you will. So here we have a non-beaked parafish. This animal does not eat coral. Instead, it scrapes algae off the seagrass blades. And you can see that its dentary, while it's gotten certainly deeper than the typical ras lower jaw, uh, it still doesn't have a beak. However, its teeth have gotten really small and they've uh, began to coalesce along the edges here. As we move closer to our uh, more derived parafishes, you can see that they're starting to become more beak-like, right? So here you can see, you can still make out the individual teeth, but this is certainly not a, a regular ras lower jaw, right? There's, there's something going on here. And by the time you reach the coral feeding wrasses, the OG uh, parafishes, if you will, uh, which you can see here is a very derived and very robust lower jaw structure. So here you can see this is a full-blown beak. And they have this flange now that now overlaps uh, overlaps the angular bone here. Uh, so this is a very robust structure, um, and these animals are taking and biting deep chunks out of uh, coral rock faces. What's interesting about uh, parafishes is that once they evolved the ability to eat coral, they didn't actually stop there. Uh, so some species, uh, especially the genus Scarus, have evolved a second a second joint in their uh, mandible called the intramandibular joint. And this allows the animal additional flexibility when they're scraping off coral. Uh, so uh, some parafishes, like the video I showed you earlier, will swim up and take like a big gouging chunk out of a piece of coral. Other parafishes will swim around and just scrape the surface and keep moving. So the parafishes that are scrapers actually have the ability to feed, I think, 30 times, 30% uh, faster than their excavating uh, cousins. So this joint isn't just a morphological novelty. It actually uh, really comes in handy when it comes to increasing your rate of consumption, especially for a new, for a for a food for a food item that is not very nutritious. So for the rest of this part of the talk, uh, we're really going to focus on two questions here. The first question is, was the evolution of the parafish beak a gradual process? So basically as parafishes evolve their beaks uh, from from within wrasses, was it a fairly was it a fairly gradual process where rates of shape evolution didn't change very much, or are there uh, peaks and valleys in terms of the rate of shape evolution? Next, was this innovation facilitated by the evolutionary modularization of the mandible? So remember I showed, remember I pointed out that it's thought that evolutionary modularity uh, facilitates morphological and functional diversification and specialization. So what role did uh, modularity play in the evolution of the parafish beak? So in order to answer this question, we took a big data approach. We micro CT scanned now up to 200 species of wrasses and parafishes, and we uh, converted these scans into 3D mesh models uh, that we use for 3D geometric morphometric analyses. So once we had our scans, we actually converted them into uh, what we call isosurfaces. So we isolated the lower jaw, and then we applied a very simple landmark scheme uh, to use basically geometric morphometrics. So the geometric morphometrics is this method that allows us to compare shapes between objects, specimens, species, you name it, uh, in a more quantitative fashion. So instead of uh, saying that, you know, that's a circle and this is a triangle, we actually are, are able to compare this with uh, real numbers, uh, which ends up being uh, very useful. So once we had our shape data, um, we, we still had to account for the rotation of the uh, dentary because some of these parafishes, they have a joint in their, uh, in their dentary and it made it really difficult to, difficult to compare shapes. So we basically used a uh, shape rotator analysis to rotate everything to a common orientation. After that, once we had our full and uh, adjusted shape data, we estimated rates of shape evolution 
um, and we fit a couple a couple models of trait evolution to our data. So uh, when we fit our models of trait evolution to our data, we fit a single rate model, which basically said there's a single rate of evolution that can explain all the sh all the uh, shape variation that we see across our species, or there's a variable rates model. So so it's either rates didn't change or rates did change. And we actually find the stronger support for the variable rates model, which already answers our first question uh, that we posed uh, a few slides ago. So it turns out that uh, the evolution of the parrotfish beak was not a gradual process. So let's see what changed. Next, um, while we were, uh, in order to study evolution, you really need a phylogeny. So this is just the phylogeny that we use. Lastly, uh, we were really interested in the degree of integration modularity between the dentary and the angular bones here. Uh, so we basically quantified uh, trait covariation using a couple of different metrics. I won't really get into that here, but if you have any questions, please ask me at the end of the talk. So let's get into some results. So what you're looking at now is a phylomorphospace analysis. So to break it down, a phylomorphospace analysis uh, shows your, basically allows you to visualize trait data for different species uh, with, a with a phylogeny projected underneath them. So here, each dot represents a different species, and the lines that connect them are actually the phylogeny that I showed you a little while ago. So here I have our coral feeding parafishes, which form a clade, uh, and they're in red down here. And as you can see, they're basically out there by themselves. And then in green, you can see our algae feeding parafishes, which don't have beaks, which overlap quite a bit with these other wrasses. So uh, remember, I told you it was thought that the algae feeding parafishes were really a transitional form between regular wrasses and our coral feeding wrasses. And our shape analysis is actually demonstrating that very clearly. One of the cool things about geometric morphometrics is that it actually allows us to break up shape configurations to analyze different parts separately. So when we look at just the dentary, the tooth bearing bone, in our analysis, uh, when we look at the uh, polymorphospace analysis of that, we see a very clear pattern of dispersion here, right? So the coral feeding parafishes are certainly out by themselves now. And now we're seeing that the algae feeding non beak parafishes are occupy a clearly transitional uh, region of this morpho space. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. However, when we look at our angular bone, uh, things are far more chaotic and they make far less sense. Fortunately, uh, this, this bone ends up behaving in some downstream analyses. So what about rates? So here I've transformed the uh, that phylogeny that I showed you earlier. I transformed it and I plotted it as a circle and I scaled the branch lengths for each species by the rate of shape evolution. So long branches correspond to fast rates of shape evolution. So before we focus in on our parafishes over here that are colored, uh, I do wanna point out that parafishes are by far not the only story here in wrasses. <laughs> wrasses are doing insane things with their jaws. So here we have the sling jaw wrasse down here, uh, which is off the charts in terms of rates of shape evolution. We have a bird wrasse over here, which is uh, these fishes have grown, grown these really elongate snouts. They look really, really weird. And we have another independent lineage of wrasses that also evolve beaks that are moving pretty fast. So wrasses are doing crazy things with their jaws, period. Now, when we look at parafishes, we see a very interesting pattern. We see what I call a biphasic shift in the rates of shape evolution. So what that means is at the base of parafishes, we see that there is a gigantic rate shift just leading up to parafishes in general. So basically, parafishes, they said, boom. I now have a deep dentary, and, and after evolving that dentary, that deeper than usual dentary, the coral, the coral feeding clated parafishes subsequently adapted it into a beak, which is pretty crazy. So you see this kind of two pulse pattern in the rate of shape evolution that you don't really recover over here in the seagrass clade. When we look at the, uh, the, set, the individual bones separately, we see qualitatively the same pattern where things that were fast move like the entire jaw, remain fast. And the same basically goes for the angular bone as well. So where do we see, so where have we seen this biphasic pattern of uh, rate shifts before? Uh, we've actually seen it in the pharyngeal jaw. So a couple years ago, me and my colleagues uh, wrote a paper looking at the evolution of the pharyngeal jaw apparatus across wrasses. And what we found was that, again, in parafishes down here, there was a very characteristic biphasic shift in the rate of evolution. So at the base of all parafishes, there was a massive rate shift. And then another one occurred here in the coral feeding clade 
uh, again. So basically, it's looking like the trophic structures of pair of fishes are following this really characteristic biphasic shift in the rate of in the rate of shape evolution. So what about integration? So when we analyzed patterns of trade integration across all races, what we found was that for the most part, shape changes are fairly integrated between the denary and the angular bones. Uh, so basically, changes that occur in the denary are fairly, fairly strongly reflected in the angular. However, there are some outliers. So one of the outliers is actually our bird races down here. So bird races have a really long denary and a very regular looking angular bone, actually. Uh, so there actually might be quite a bit of modularity going on within that particular clade. But across all races as a whole, they're fairly integrated. So what happens when we analyze parafishes separately? So when we analyze parafishes separately, what we find is much of the same. Turns out parafishes generally maintain uh, uh, average RAS patterns of integration between the denary and the angular bones. So this was actually a really, really surprising finding. So remember I told you that evolutionary integration is actually thought to constrain uh, rates of morphological evolution and morphological diversification. However, what we, however, we found that the evolutionary parafish beak was actually a very rapid process, uh, despite being uh, strongly integrated. So are parafishes weird? Are they the exception that, that proves the rule? Are there other groups that are doing this? So uh, when we actually look at our friends, the birds, a lot of work has been done on integration modularity of the bird skull. So we know that birds have evolved all these crazy uh, beak morphologies and skull morphologies. We have Darwin's finches and whatnot. Uh, but however, when we look at the patterns of integration across birds, across the skull, turns out that birds are actually fairly integrated across their skulls as well. In fact, it's thought that birds might have actually conserved their patterns of integration from their uh, early archosaur ancestors. So birds haven't changed too much in their patterns of integration, and yet they've really rapidly morphologically diversified. So how's this happening? So it turns out there is a special case where you can get uh, rapid rates of morphological uh, evolution in the face of really strong integration. And that occurs when there's, when there's evolution along phenotypic lines of least resistance. So basically, uh, evolution along lines of least uh, phenotypic resistance um, predicts that as long as uh, it's selectively beneficial to integrate your traits, uh, you will uh, a lineage will experience faster and faster rates of shape evolution towards a particular optimum. So uh, basically, as long as it's uh, selectively beneficial to be integrated, an animal or, or, or lineage will actually evolve very rapidly. Because if you remember earlier, I mentioned uh, that if you're integrated, if you change one trait, you can change multiple traits. So as long as you're, as long as it's not deleterious to change multiple traits at once, you can actually get weird really, really fast uh, because you're all your basically all of your your entire body is moving in lockstep to track a selected optimum. So integration can actually really be more of a highway to rapid morphological uh, innovation as long as it's not deleterious. So what's going on in the parapitch beak? So we actually think that uh, feeding on hard corals uh, can exert some uh, very powerful and very strong selective pressure on the entire trophic apparatus of the parrotfish. So uh, it, might be, it might behoove these animals to maintain a strong pattern of integration across the skull. Uh, basically, the last thing you want, if you're trying to feed on uh, hard rocks, the last thing you want is to have a nice strong beak and weak jaws in your throat, right? Because you, then you'll be able to ingest the coral, but you won't be able to break it down. So it actually becomes very uh, selectively beneficial to have all of your body parts on the same page. Um, therefore, we think that selection is actually uh, maintaining patterns of integration across the parafish skull. So to conclude this part, uh, the evolution of the parafish beak allowed wrasses to uh, colonize a novel region of morphospace. That's what we saw in our final morphospace analysis. And we find that the uh, parafish actually colonizes region of shape space very, very quickly, 13, 13 times faster than the background rate. And uh, it turns out when we looked at patterns of integration across the skull, that the parafish beak was highly integrated, uh, which, is pretty, which is pretty impressive and pretty surprising. So, the next group of fishes we'll be talking about might even be otter, well, certainly are otter than the parafishes. Um, and we'll be looking at the role that integration plays in this, in a completely different group of fishes, but also uh, marine fish. So the group that we'll be talking about next are the carrying garians. Uh, the, the name can be a bit of a mouthful, but this clade of fishes is very near and dear to my heart. They uh, and include some very, very charismatic fish, some fishes that grew up fish, uh, catching hook and line and things like that. Carangarians are a fairly, are very morphologically diverse lineage of fish. They include things like 
barracuda, jacks, swordfish, mahi mahi, uh, and some really, really charismatic and cool looking fish. They also include flatfish. Uh, flatfish are one of the weirdest vertebrates on the planet. Uh, they are also the most asymmetrical vertebrate uh, on the planet. So flat in, in a flatfish, both eyes are actually on the same side of the head. Uh, this is, and this uh, creates a very strikingly bizarre morphology. So here you can see this parrotfish is not laying on its belly, it's laying on its left side. So in development, one of these eyes moves over to the other side of this animal, creating this very asymmetric appearance. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just really, really odd. And this asymmetry actually extends all the way down the body. So all, most of the organs in the flatfish are all contorted really weird. Even the coloring on this animal is asymmetrical. So the top of this flatfish is brown and pigmented and kind of fish-like. But if you were to lift this flatfish up, the other side of it is actually completely white. Uh, and depigmented because this animal has evolved to, has uh, basically evolved to lay on the bottom. Uh, so this is a very striking morphological adaptation and a very kind of odd and horrific thing to look at every day if you study flatfishes. Despite all of these anatomical abnormalities, uh, flatfish are actually fairly diverse as a clade. There are over 800 species of flatfish. So that's more than wrasses. So there's 800 species of things that are swimming around looking like this. It's kind of wild. But how does one become a flatfish in the first place? So, uh, it's, so this actually ends up being a very interesting story. So when a flatfish hatches out of its egg, it actually hatches as a symmetrical fish. It looks like a regular fish. However, over the course of a couple of days or a couple of hours, uh, one of the eyes of this animal will actually begin to migrate to the other side of the head. Uh, so if you thought that your puberty was bad, flatfish puberty is probably far, far worse. Imagine just like being a teenager and one of your eyes starts shooting over to the other side of your face and no one's telling you why, right? Uh, so <laughs> the uh, flatfish metamorphosis is a very, very striking uh, phenomenon that you see. What's more interesting about this uh, metamorphosis in flatfish is that it's actually recapitulated in their evolutionary history. So flatfishes originally evolved from symmetrical fish ancestors and gradually one of their eyes began to migrate to the other side of their head, resulting in the very, uh, the very characteristic asymmetrical adults that we see today. Uh, so it turns out that the development of the flatfish is recapitulated in its evolutionary history. So uh, we'll be asking similar questions for this portion of the talk uh, for flatfishes. So the first question is, what is the tempo and mode of skull shape evolution in flatfishes? So was the were there changes in the rate of shape evolution leading up to leading up to the uh, flatfish skull? Secondly, what was the role of integration modularity do, during the evolution of asymmetry in this group? So we know that uh, the parafish beak was highly integrated. What's going on in the flatfish skull? So in order so in order to answer this question, we used very similar methods uh, where we micro CT scanned a bunch of flatfish and their relatives, uh, and we isolated out the neurocranium, which is basically the upper jaw in these fishes and we use geometric morphometrics. So here uh, we here here's a nice isolated near cranium. We applied some three-dimensional landmarks to compare shape changes uh, between species. And when you're dealing with flatfish, flatfish have this unique problem where not all species are asymmetrical on the same side. So you have some left-handed flatfish and you have some right-handed flatfish. Um, in order to, and this creates some gigantic problems when, when you're comparing shapes because animals have completely, some animals have completely inverted their bodies and then nothing makes sense. So in order to fix this, we standardized the migrating orbit of all these fishes to the right side, which was, uh, which is seems, which sounds simple, but it was actually the, this fun, cool thing that I learned. It was fun. Next, again, uh, like we did with the wrasses, we estimated rates of shape evolution um, and we fit a couple models of trade evolution to our shape data. And again, we found a strong support for a variable rates model of shape evolution, uh, suggesting that rates have certainly changed over the evolution of Karangaria. Where did they change though? In order to answer these questions about evolution, we again, uh, we use the most recent phylogeny. Lastly, we were interested again in quantifying integration modularity. Um, so we again, uh, use a couple different metrics to quantify integration modularity and to come up with a, a best fitting model hypothesis for uh, what the modules are across a flatfish skull. So let's get into some of our results. So here I'm showing you the results of a principal components analysis. 
uh, that basically shows you the primary axes of variation of the traits that are contributing most uh, or, or, or the traits that are most variable uh, across our data set. So here I have each landmark that we've placed on all our red fishes uh, color coded by uh, variants. So red indicates uh, landmarks that, are, that have a lot of variants and blue are fairly conserved landmarks that don't change that much in their relative, in their relative placement. So here you can see the migrating orbit over here looking dorsally on this fish is lit up, it's bright red. And that's because over all of, almost all of the shape variation, so over half of it really corresponds to where the eye is relative to the, relative to the other eye on the fish skull. So the first uh, axis, so the first principal axis of our shape variation, which is considered to be the most important axis of shape variation, really corresponds to, are you a flatfish, are you not? And this is a this is kind of a crazy finding because you have to remember the animals that we have in our data set. Like these aren't like regular fish, right? We have barracudas, we have swordfish, we have jacks. We have fishes that are doing some insane things with, with their skulls in their own right. And yet flatfishes are dominating almost half of the entire signal of shape variation, which is pretty impressive, right? And then when we get to our second PC axis here, uh, we start seeing like regular patterns of fish variation, like blah, 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 you know, like skull depth. Uh, kidding, it's important, but flatfish is really dominating the signal here. And when we look at our phylomorphous based analysis, it becomes very, very clear. So I showed you earlier how parafishes colonize their own, you know, unique region to shape space. They really got nothing on flatfishes, right? Flatfishes are over here, and every other animal or every other fish in this clay that thought it was important got folded off and stuffed into a corner <laughs> in this region of in this region of morpho space. And that's because, and uh, you can really see that very clearly. And remember, PC1 here, our x axis corresponds to uh, orbit placement or uh, orbital position. So, again, flatfishes have certainly colonized their own unique region of morpho space. So, let's look at rates. So, uh, in this particular uh, diagram for rates, I've color coded the branches of the phylogeny by rate. So, uh, reds correspond to faster rates of shape evolution and blues correspond to slower rates. So here you can see, uh, if we go through the evolutionary history of Karangaria, at their onset, this clade is famous for having rapidly morphologically diversified after the meteor struck 66 million years ago. So basically, the meteor strikes and these fishes take off in terms of shape evolution. And shortly after, about three million years, over the course of about three million years, flatfishes go completely asymmetrical. It's wild, like, like down here, all these fishes are like, oh, you know, I'm gonna evolve a really long snout, or I'm gonna evolve the ability to like stick to things. And flatfishes are like, yo, I'm gonna twist my whole eye to the other side of my body, right? So flatfishes are going nuts, and this is a very rapid process. Uh, so it turns out that the evolution of asymmetry occurred really, really quickly, and it was a very rapid process. But what's integration doing? So when we look at the, when we compare patterns of integration between flatfishes and non-flatfishes, we find that flatfishes are significantly more integrated than their non-flat relatives, which again was really, which was, which then was kind of crazy because remember I, I mentioned earlier that modularity was thought to facilitate all of this rapid trait diversification, but here we're seeing really integrated clades do some really, really impressive things with their morphology and, and very quickly at that. So I mentioned that flatfishes were integrated in their evolution. So when we look at their rates of evolution, so here I have our same landmarks, and now I've colored them by the rate of shape evolution. So here reds again correspond to fast rates and blues correspond to slow rates. As you can see, most of the skull is actually evolving at a near, at a near equal rate. However, the slower region here is really the parasphenoid and kind of the back end of the skull. Uh, but most of the flatfish skull is fairly fast and uh, evolving at fairly even rates. Uh, and this is just kind of driving the point home that a lot of these shape changes have actually been integrated across the whole skull and not just the orbit which was actually surprising for us. So what is going on yet again? So again, evolution integration is supposed to constrain rates of morphological diversification, but here we found that the evolution of asymmetry was rapid, was super rapid. Uh, these animals colonized a novel region of trait space, and it occurred uh, over the course of 3 million years, despite being highly integrated. So in this case, uh, we actually think that uh, the uh, integration uh, that we're seeing across evolution in these flatfishes is mirroring the integration that they exhibit in development. So here I have a metamorphosing, a metamorphosing flatfish larva uh, as a GIF, 
And as you can see, the eye is going to gradually migrate to the side of the, to the uh, to the side of the head. But the eye aside, if you look at the body of this animal, there are actually changes going on all across the body as this fish is becoming more and more asymmetrical. And we know that from the fossil record, flatfishes, uh, re their development recapitulates their uh, evolution. And, uh, we, and we believe that this recapitulation is also reflected in the integration uh, of their skull during the evolution of asymmetry. So to conclude, we found that the Karangaria rapidly morphologically diversified after the end Cretaceous extinction event. So the meteor strikes, dinosaurs die, flatfishes celebrate. We also find that the evolution of asymmetry was a very, very rapid innovation that occurred during the presence of very strong integration across the skull. And we believe that this integration is uh, a reflection of, of the developmental integration that these flatfishes exhibit uh, while they're growing. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, so I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't know, Jamie. Okay. Not yet, but you just ask one and then they usually start rolling in. Yeah, so excellent talk. I did not know that much about fishes, obviously, um, <laughs> but they are super cool. And then I did get a little hint of your birds versus fish um situation in there <laughs> but, just a little man yeah so i did um i just did want to ask you because we do have a heavily undergrad audience mm -hmm. um sort of how you got into your work what made it appealing to you um maybe you know are you looking for more students that kind of thing yeah, that's a so that's a great question. So uh, I got into fishes pretty early. I was uh, I, I think I was in my the end of my first year of high school. I'm from Philly, and I grew up and I just started kind of keeping pet fish in my aquarium, in my bedroom. Um, and then over time, I kind of really got into it. So I was like, oh, you know, maybe I'll go to college and be a marine biologist. Uh, and so I did. Um, and uh, yeah, so at first I was really into kind of animal ecology. So I wanted to know like how these animals were living and I wanted to study them in the wild and watch them eat stuff. Uh, but over time I decided, I, I felt like I needed to be like closer to the animal, like inside of it. <laughs> so I, I started, I went to grad school in uh, UL Lafayette and I kind of worked a lot on my morphology and things like that. And gradually I just kind of followed the fish. I just, you know, I just followed whatever was interesting to me at the time. And uh, somehow I ended up in flat fishes. <laughs> and uh, who knows uh, where I'll be in like two months. <laughs> well, that kind of leads me to my next um, place. Like, is there a fish that you just dream of scanning and you just haven't had the time, the opportunity to do so yet? Yes, uh, actually I knocked out a couple a couple of fishes that I, I had a couple of fishes on my list and I knocked them out last week. Uh, but the Mola Mola is still there. Uh, it's still, you know, the the, the great white whale <laughs> that I'm hunting. They're very large, so it's hard to get them in a the scanner. Um, and, and so that's the that's the issue. Uh, but we're working on it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. And then what's sort of the next question you have in mind? What do you want to? Right. So the next question that I have is uh, not so much focused just on the morphology, but I want to figure out how the morphology has changed over time with respect to climate and uh, and how you might be able to pre predict morphological changes as the climate continues to change. So I want to look at the effect of climatic variability and sea surface temperature on rates of shape evolution across the 5,000 species of fish. Awesome. And yeah, yes, I am looking for students. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be super cool because that just reminds me about how you were saying that, you know, all of those white sand beaches that we love are basically parrotfish poop. And yep. it really kind of brings it full circle about how much we depend on other species to kind of facilitate the life that we enjoy. Um, yeah, it's really crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I do see a question in the Q&A now. Are the environmental pressures selecting for flatfish skull morphology known? Uh, yeah, so this is something I'm trying to get at. Uh, so I'm trying to I'm trying to dig deep and you know figure out what was that, what exactly was going on in the ocean 66 million years ago. So we know that after the meteor struck, temperatures spiked. So the ocean got really warm and sea level rose. 
So uh, the, the hypothesis right now is that as sea level rose, more bottom habitat became available uh, because now like up along the coast uh, where there was no water before, we have more water. So it's thought that maybe the evolution or the rapid uh, availability of more benthic habitats might have facilitated flatfishes trying to rapidly fit into this niche with uh, a very bizarre adaptation. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I just yeah. never think about this type of stuff with fishes. I just, I mean, <laughs> okay, obviously think they're super cool, but I never really think about everything along these lines. Um, any other questions, anybody? There is another one there. I don't know if you see it, Chelsea. I do uh, not. <laughs> too. So, uh, are there typical traits that tend to show these kinds of rapid evolution across taxa traits for feeding or defense? Right, so that's actually a good question. So uh, oftentimes we do see traits associated with feeding evolving really rapidly in some groups, uh, and sometimes it's defense as well. So I think venom is very, uh, very rapidly evolving in some snakes and things like that, as well as venom resistance, uh, <laughs> because things don't want to be eaten. Uh, so sometimes uh, traits can be under really strong selection and evolve very rapidly. Okay, I see another one. How is it that parrotfish are able to create such a durable material to make their beaks out of? That is a great question. Uh, so uh, the thought is that parrotfishes and a lot of animals actually have the ability to assimilate uh, metal that they collect in their diet in very uh, minute amounts. They can uh, they can extract it and uh, basically assimilate it into their tissues. So rast so parrotfishes. If you saw my opening slide, uh, you saw that parrotfish actually had a really nice blue beak. And, because, and the reason for that is copper. So uh, these animals have actually incorporated copper into their uh, into their um, their beaks, which make them uh, stronger. If you see a mouse or if you see like a rat, so a lot of times their their teeth are like brown or yellow at the tips. That's iron. Um, so animals have gotten really good at uh, incorporating metal into their uh, into their feeding structures. Mm, nice. Yeah. Cool. I do have a comment that says fascinating. Thanks. Um, Thank you. Do you see any other questions, Jamie? Because I don't. No, I, I don't. Sorry. I did really okay. enjoy it and I felt bad that my camera was off because you did make me laugh quite a bit. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I will admit I actually learned about parrot fish poop and, and sand from from this kid and is watching of Nick Jr. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, there is a question coming. They just need a minute to type it. Okay. So, yeah. I didn't fix it, did it fix? Okay. <clears throat> Fixed itself, as technology sometimes does. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, man, I had a I had a question and I lost it. <laughs> Compliments of getting older, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was just teaching about aging um, nervous systems and fading memory this morning. So, there you go. <laughs> did you teach them about hair cells yet? <laughs> oh, no, that's Friday, I believe. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, okay, so there's one while we're waiting for the other one. Um, fellow fish lover, I was just curious if you started out with freshwater or saltwater aquariums. I currently have three fish tanks at home that annoy my parents. Love it. Yes. So I actually started off with freshwater aquariums. I was a huge like cichlid guy, right? Uh, so I would just go to PetSmart and buy like any weird cichlid that I could that I could find. Back in the day, like PetSmart had a really nice like stock of fish, so you could do that. I think I had almost seven tanks in my room at one point. So you want to talk about annoying parents? Whew. Man. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> nice. But you're just an animal lover in general, right? Because when we were in I, grad school, you had a snake. I did have a snake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cha cha. Yep. Yeah, I just love animals in general. I like going outside. I'll catch them in the wild occasionally and things like that. They're fun. <laughs> nice. Um. So. Oh, there, you finally got it in. I was going to ask. <laughs> Is the formation of beaks and mollusks a completely different evolutionary process from fish or birds? For instance, 
is the beak of an octopus not truly a beak in the same sense as a plate of fused teeth? Right. Okay. So this is actually a great question. Uh, so beaks, what we call beaks, is actually quite a bit different, even in other fishes. So pufferfish have beaks too, but they're not the same as parrotfish beaks. Oftentimes they're just fused large plates of teeth. Uh, in the case of a parrotfish beak, it's a cemented structure of multiple individual tiny teeth. So in the case of mollusk beaks, uh, obviously mollusks don't have bone. Uh, so I believe that the octopus beak, the cephalopod beak is made out of, what is it like chitin or something like that? Uh, it's still really strong, uh, but it's a completely different uh, structure. So with research like this, which is like, I mean, what kinds of stuff do you keep in your actual lab and what sort of trips do you and your students get to take? <laughs> I always question. thought that was so fascinating when I'm a cell and molecular biologist, we don't travel much to, to cool places, but um, yeah, how do you do it? So it uh, turns out we keep, uh, so I have a lot of, I guess, preserved fish in my lab, but I have a fish room to keep some fish alive. Uh, so we have a couple of fish tanks in lab um, and most of the most of the, the the grunt work is really in the field. So we get to go to a bunch of cool places. In grad school, I uh, mostly went to South America. Um, these days, we'll be heading to French Polynesia, so Tahiti, uh, to chase around some fish on coral reefs and try to catch them. And we'll be going there at the end of the month. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's pretty fun. <laughs> so we we go to some cool places. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I got into cell work because I didn't want to be in the field, but now it seems like it's <laughs> 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 it like you're doing some good stuff. That's right. <laughs> oh, Jamie, I think you're muted. Jamie, you were saying something. Oh, oh sorry. No, no, no. It's all right. Oh, okay. There's another question there. Go for it. Oh, OK. Um, so this one says, hi, Corey, with the reduction of our coral reefs, do you think the parrotfish will be able to feed off the sea bottom without scraping the coral? Hey, it's Mr. Gordon. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, turns out um, the coral feeding parrotfishes are going to have a rough time, obviously, with the reduction of coral reefs. What's interesting is that the uh, studies have shown that the, al the algae feeding or the algae feeding uh, parrotfishes are actually going to have a blast. Uh, it's thought that they're going to expand their ranges. So whenever a coral reef is on the basically on the downtrend, what ends up happening is algae then begins to dominate what was uh, essentially a coral reef. So where the where the coral dies, algae then takes over. So if you're a coral feeding pair of fish, you can have a bad time. But if you eat algae, there's more algae for you. Uh, so uh, some pair of fishes are going to do well and others are not going to do well. I guess you can give it another second to see if there, oh, she said thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, I'll go ahead and say thank you so much. I appreciated it. This was a good seminar to end our year on. It was engaging and fun, so thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes, you do have a particular talent for mixing in pop culture with your research. <laughs> Like I said, I just feel bad that you look like you probably felt like you were talking to yourself, but I'm sure the others on here were, were enjoying it as well. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I got a few, a few chuckles. Yeah. That's why we do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Kind of winding down. I don't see anything coming through right now, um, but maybe give everybody like your social media because he has a huge following on Twitter, um, regularly posting <laughs> cool stuff about fishes and whatnot. So maybe do that and people can kind of reach out if they have other questions or. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, you just type my name in the search bar, it'll come up and uh, yeah. Follow them. Give me a follow. I'm funny sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I think throughout this year, we've learned that science social media is really good, like good for finding jobs and um, postdocs, grad school, all kinds of things. If you follow uh, other scientists on social media, it's quite informative. So, absolutely. 
Uh, okay, we have another one. So thanks for an enjoyable presentation. In cases of convergent evolution, do the unrelated species show genetic similarities? That is a good question. Uh, sometimes. So uh, sometimes animals can, or sometimes organisms can evolve very similar morphologies through very different genetic means. Uh, in other cases, sometimes it's the same uh, mutation uh, in the same place in different animals, or I keep saying animals, different organisms that are produced uh, similar morphologies. So it actually it varies from in case to case. Thank you. All right. Well, I don't know, Jamie, do you want to give it another minute or should we? No, oh, I think that's probably they've had a chance to type them in. So, um, All right. yeah, we'll just thank you for your time. Okay. Not yeah, a problem. Thank you so much. And we should definitely catch up. It's been a, it's been a little minute since grad school. Really <laughs> <has>. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Evans. Thanks.